Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm very pleased to be joined by Tommy Fleetwood of Team Europe. Tommy, it's five years now since that incredible experience in Paris. How much are you looking forward to playing back on European soil again in the Ryder Cup? Yeah, it's a very cool, um, it's a very cool atmosphere and a very cool vibe um, playing a home one. I think I was very fortunate that my um, first ever Ryder Cup experience was Paris. Um, you know, with the team that we had, the home fans, the captain, um, everything about it was very, very special. So, um, you know, equally, um, an, aw an away one is an amazing experience as well, just in a very different way. But um, coming back home um, and seeing all the, the blue and yellow is very, very cool. Thank you, Tommy. We'll start some questions on mic one on the left-hand side. Tommy, uh, how much do you find yourself humming the Tommy Fleetwood chant? Like, kind of... Not very often, no, I'll leave that to other people. Um, uh, I, I, I'll encourage it as much as possible. Hopefully my golf brings it out. Um, but yeah, it's not something that I uh, play along in my head very much. Not like doing the dishes or anything? You don't hum in? Or... I don't do the dishes, no, I'm not. Uh, we have a dishwasher. <laughs> we'll go to Dan just behind there. Congratulations on the dishwasher. Thank you. Um, this is your third Ryder Cup, but the first one without kind of the old guard that left... The Westwoods, Holters, Stenson. Uh, who's kind of stepped up to fill that void in, in the leadership positions? I know Rose is here, but apart from him, you guys are all pretty young. Yeah, of course, and it's um, yeah, it's it's different. I think, and I I spoke about it um, just the other week when um, I sort of got into the team in Paris, and it was still the same um, at the last one in Whistling Straits. Um, you, you sort of walk into a um, what has been a legacy of, a, you know, definitely my Ryder Cup, my generation of Ryder Cups has been um, those guys that were um, such a huge presence um, on the course and off the course. And um, it was honestly um, the most amazing experience seeing um, those guys in that team atmosphere, in that team environment. Um, and yeah, this is, this is very different. I think there's been a natural progression for um, a few of the guys. I think... Um, uh, you look at the likes of, um, I think there's a, a core group of us that have played two or three Ryder Cups now, and yeah, that's not, the, um, that's not the experience of what those guys had in terms of numbers, but I think um, we've all grown um, as Ryder Cup players together, and I think that is, um, that's something that's really cool, and I think we're all very comfortable in um, the roles. That I, I think it's a natural progression for everybody. I don't think anybody really has to... Um, step up in particular or talk about it or take it upon themselves to do to do anything different i think it's just a natural cycle of what um, happens in those teams in the Ryder cups and um you know we still have um a couple of you know current legends of the Ryder cup in justin and rory and then a few of us that are um you know hoping to follow in their footsteps and and make our own you know legacy over the next year of Ryder cups but it's um yeah it's different but it's nice to see sort of the progression of what happens to guys Okay, we'll stay on mic one, um, Andrew. Tommy, we, we saw you stop during the middle of your round at one point to watch some of your, the highlights of yourself in 2018 <laughs> on the big screen. It was in my face, it wasn't like... I... <laughs> what, what was, but you were watching it, what, what was going through your mind and what do those memories mean to you? Well, yeah, they're nicer to watch than like bad memories or, you know, times when you've chopped it around. Um, yeah, like Paris, I think, owns a special place in a lot of our hearts, and it was the last Ryder Cup that we won, and um, it's been five years, so it's actually been quite a long time. Um, and I think just Ryder Cup memories in general and moments on the golf course that everyone's had, I think they, um, you know, they don't take much to, to come back to the front of your mind, and I think it's just very cool sort of being able to watch those watch those back it's a very special occasion and for us that have the chance to have played and um and have those moments i think anytime it's sort of around it's quite a nice thing to just uh, turn your attention to across to the right hand side and microphone four please there <laughs> yes, you're right <laughs> sorry about that, sorry about that. Uh, tommy i was watching the open few holes and it's quite interesting looking at the rough i think rory hit a shot his tee shot and it took a few minutes to find i know Seth was just practicing on the second just trying to um, get the ball out for on the rough near the, the second green. Um, how would you describe the rough, and might it be an advantage to the Europeans in the coming days? Um, it's thick for sure. I always find it. Um, 
I always find it difficult to say courses have a certain advantage for either team. I think um, you look at the strength of both teams, it's obviously very difficult to find advantages um, here and there. But, of course, the home side will always look for, for those things in particular that will, that will help them. Um, the rough stick, um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty penal. And I think um, particularly on um, a few holes, like dogleg holes, there's, there's a lot of doglegs on the golf course, and I think it's easy to... Um, try and be very aggressive or find yourself being aggressive and I don't think you, you know you're not going to get away with it every shot um, so I don't think the course lends itself to that very much it's not going to you know it's not going to give you many favors it's not going to give you much luck but um, it's it's just a demanding um, tee to green course it really really is and um, I think we all you know enjoy enjoy the setup I think it's I think it's very fair I just think that um, you know you have to manage your way around a lot. Okay, we'll cross over to the left and Anne on mic one. Hi, Tommy. Uh, Zach Johnson has talked about player input and how important that is as far as, as, far as criteria for selecting the, the picks and during the week. What's it like, I'm curious, with the European team? How much player input is there between the players and, and the captain of the European team? Well, I think, of course, um, captains want to going to want to know how players are feeling and um, what they're thinking um, the captains and the vice captains are in constant communication with us all um, but at the same time you know uh, Luke is our captain and um, he's the one that um, calls the shots and he you know we put our you know absolute faith in him to make the decisions on all the information that he has from from you know whether that's player input on how they're feeling whether that's stats whether that's his gut instinct um, and then he you know, is going to turn it over and put his faith, on, faith in us on the golf course. But I think, um, you know, Luke's been unbelievable. And I think, um, you know, watching him speak through this whole process um, and, and having him around, I think everybody just, um, you know, has, has loved his captaincy, um, the way he's gone about things. And I think, um, you know, we're all looking forward to playing for him and under him um, in the Radical. Okay, we'll just go the row behind on mic three, please. Tommy, following up on uh, over here, the, the so, rough, sorry, uh, the rough and the conditions of the course. So much was made of the tight setup at Paris, playing to the strengths of the Europeans. What are your thoughts on out here at Marco Simone, where there's there's thick stuff, but it is more of a graduated rough approach in terms of where you can miss it close to the fairway. Yeah, I think it's a very fair setup, um, and 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 yeah, Paris was. Um, I, I think overall, I feel like the crowd was a bit further away in Paris, so um, the rough was thick straight off the bat once you missed the fairway, and it just continued at that same level for a very long time. I think the crowd's a bit closer this time, so there's, there's always going to be that sort of chance of it being trampled down. But, um, yeah, it's a bit more graded, but at the same time, very, very penal. And I think it just goes back to that. Um, you know, as soon as you make the decision to be aggressive, um, you're going to just have to live with a good shot or a bad shot. And... Um, I think any time, sort of, you know, you, you might get lucky once, but uh, yeah, I, I think wide shots or sort of shots that are a little bit errant are just always going to be um, punished in a pretty, you know, potentially pretty harsh way. Okay, go down the front with Evan. Tommy, um, given the way you played with Francesco in Paris and the fact that he's still on the team, involved in the team this week, is there a part of you that wants desperately to give him a win in Italy, a Ryder Cup win in Italy? Yeah, it'd be great, wouldn't it, for uh, for both Fran and Eduardo. I think having uh, what a you know special time for the the country to have um, to have the two brothers um, that have kind of been the face of Italian golf for a long time now. Um, and I think yeah, I, I know both of them would always you know would rather be playing. That's just how we feel as players. But I think having them involved, it's special for them as well. And um, on a, on a personal level, I'm still you know so so close to. Fran and, and Valentina and the family and um, always having him around um, and, you know, being around him at dinners or in the day and, and chatting to him is very, very cool for me. And um, again, you know, he, he might not have been there in Whiston Straits, but I've been very, you know, close to him in my Ryder Cup journey, if you like. So it's, um, he's played a huge part in that so far. And, and just to follow up, how big do you think a Ryder Cup in Italy is for the golf landscape here? Yeah, hopefully it will. Um, hopefully it'll do great. You know, I'm uh, always a big supporter in you know golf in all of the <laughs> of the European countries, and um, 
Italy, I, you know, I have great memories of Italy playing in junior golf and amateur golf and, and the European Tour, the Italian Open has always been such a, a cool event for us. So um, being able to bring the Ryder Cup here, um, have it, you know, showcase the game and the country and the city for um, this one week, um, hopefully um, will play a huge part in the game continuing to grow for, for Italy. Okay, we'll two, take two questions on mic three, if you can pass it behind afterwards. Hi, hi Tommy. Uh, every couple of years we ask you guys um, about the difference in mentality coming out into a team event and a singles event. Can you just talk to us again about that, how, how you mentally prepare in these days and how different it is than the kind of singular focus you have for a normal tournament? I think the first thing, I think it, um, it's a much more emotional week than what we're used to, where you're always just um, very zoned in in what you're doing and you have your your particular team of, you know, a few people around you. Um, and I think this week, um, it's, it's, it's a week that people dream of in their careers. And I think that um, when, I can only speak on the European side, obviously, but the times when I've been around the European team room, uh, you get the players together, the vice captains, the captain, the, the backroom staff, the families um, and it, it is from the get-go, like from, from the Monday, everybody being together, you have such a great time. It's a very emotional time. You're all playing for each other. We all feel very, very strongly about um, the Ryder Cup and the tournament. And, um, and you know, it's, it's a, we feel, you know, it, it's a massive privilege to be, um, have the responsibility of carrying the legacy on of European golf and European players in the Ryder Cup. And I think we're all very aware of that and anybody that's been involved in the European Ryder Cups over the years make sure that we all that's always at the front of our minds when we get when we get here and um, and I think it's just a very very special time and it does have a extremely unique feeling from Monday all the way through to, to Sunday and still um, you know I as, as an individual I, I win nowhere near as much as I would like um, but winning as a team has definitely been um, the highlight of my career. Okay, stay on there with Neil, please. Uh, hi, Tony. H how difficult a balancing act is it for someone like Phil Kenyon this week with a foot in both camps? Well, that's what the Americans think. <laughs> uh, now, he's, um, he, you know, like Phil um, is somebody that's very close to me from Southport. I've known him, known him for a long time and always very supportive of, uh, you know, his career as well as my career. I think... Um, yeah, it's it's it, nobody really makes it very difficult. He's doing his best for his players, of course he is. And then um, it's our it's down to us when we're out on the golf course. You know, Phil's just uh, Phil's there as support and is helping the players that choose to work with him in their careers. And I don't think you know we're playing playing a team event this week. Um, I would never wish uh, Paul on anybody, and I'm I'm glad that Phil um, has the opportunity to work with someone like Scotty and help him along in his career. Um, and yeah, hopefully his putting takes another week uh, to uh, to really get hot. But um, you know, it, it still it'd be great. And I think we all you know love um, playing against the best players in the world, and we would like um, to play them on their best form. And um, you know, it's it's just great. And I think it's an amazing experience for coaches as well as players. Okay, we'll have the final question from Doug, please. Tommy, given your given your experience playing, contending on on big stages, what is it about a home crowd at a Ryder Cup that can bring out extraordinary shots? If it can, and if it can't, please make something up. <laughs> um, I think they just play such a huge part in um, in the moment. Um, I had some great shots at Whistling Straits, just nobody really cheered them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, but they they are like the the crowds. Um, from, from, like, if you look at the week, I think the crowd are there to lift you um, at all times. And I think when it's going well, you, you absolutely ride the wave of a home crowd and the momentum that they're creating, the cheers, the sound, the noise. Um, that's amazing. And, and, you know, they're there to lift you up if it's not going so well. And it is, it is definitely, um, you know, an advantage to have the home crowd around. And then I think you look at Ryder Cup moments, um, puts hold or shots hit, um, the crowd is part of that. The reaction that you get, the roars that you get, they play a huge part in your memories. So um, I think they, you know, they bring that as well. Um, you know, so far in my career, there's nothing like playing in front of um, a home crowd. And I know this one will just be the same. 
like what? Like Cirque du Soleil or like, <laughs> um, um, yeah, look, it's, it's our job as well as home players to make sure that the crowd are um, as involved as possible and um, they have something to cheer about. So absolutely, I think um, that, you know, I, I remember, um, for example, on, in the afternoon of the Friday um, in Paris, um, we'd, had a, we'd had a rough start to the Ryder Cup. We lost our first three games. Um, and then, you know, me and Fran turned our match around. But the afternoon felt like we were breezing through the day just because the first three matches were playing so well we just rode the wave of what they brought and the crowd brought and all we were we were at the back and we were like well you know everybody's just carrying us forward and, and that actually made a huge difference and you're playing you know there's 60,000 people that are on your side and that are, that are pushing you along and I, I just I do you know remember that day in particular after a grind in the morning the afternoon felt like we were just playing you know with the crowd and they were just lifting us and we were bree breezing through but that is also because of you know the way that the guys were playing as well so um you know everybody plays a part in that okay tommy thanks for joining us we Thank wish you well this week thanks guys Okay, welcome back. We're very pleased to be joined by Sepp Stracker of Team Europe. Sepp, your first Ryder Cup. Uh, How has it been in the team room and on the course just now? Um, it's been great. Uh, it's been really great. Uh, starting with the uh, practice trip we had here a couple weeks ago, um, and even during Wentworth. Um, and then, yeah, today was, was a great day. Uh, getting to see the course, it's in incredible shape. Um, playing a few matches out there, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, we'll go into some questions. Start with you, Dan. If you could get the mic across to him, please. Thanks. I know we've made a lot about the way that you speak and that you don't have an accent, um, but I'm wondering, the, you know, the last, you moved when you were out 14, is that right? Yeah. So for these last, you know, 15 years or so, have you felt yourself becoming Americanized and has this process been kind of bringing you back to your roots in a way? Um, maybe in a way, but not, I don't know. I feel like I've grown up kind of a split. You know, my mom's American, uh, spent a lot of time in the States when I was 14, moved, moved to the States, but uh, I've always felt really close to my Austrian heritage. Uh, my dad's Austrian always made sure I spent a lot of time going back um, and yeah uh, it's if anything it's uh, allowed me to spend more time in Austria which is always great um, and uh, yeah get back to see a lot of friends and, and family okay we'll just move along the line to yeah similarly, similarly Sam, has there been any sense of sort of mixed emotions going into this event in, in any way not really no <laughs> I just follow up, um, how much this week sort of been a getting to know exercise for some of the players maybe on the European tour who don't know that much because you obviously spend so much time uh, in the States, have you been get, getting to know them quite a lot this week? 
Um, I feel like I've known all of them for quite a while now. Um, I don't think there's anybody that I haven't known for less than four or five years. Um, but, you know, getting to spend more time around them, more quality time around them, uh, playing rounds uh, with them, practice rounds, um, has been great. Uh, you know, it started with the practice trip a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, you know, the team bonding has, has been incredible. Um, team dinners and, and all that, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, just getting to, getting to know a lot of the guys has been great. Okay, we'll cross to the other side on microphone four there, please. Hey, Seth, I was watching um, some of your practice holes. I know it's on the second in particular. You spent quite a lot of time putting the ball just off the green into quite deep rough and trying to chip it out. What do you make of the rough here? How does it compare? And uh, will it have to, you have to change your strategy or the team in any way? Yeah, it's uh, very thick, and um, especially out the fairways. You know, the blades are really thick, and it's very different than anything you see uh, almost anywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, the ball comes out pretty slow most of the time. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely want to spend a lot of time, especially around the greens, uh, getting the feel right and, um, and kind of, you know, uh, preparing for that. Okay, we'll just jump forward to microphone two, please. Hi, Seb. Hi. I'd love to do this in an Austrian accent, but I guess <laughs> the rest of the room appreciates it in English. Um, so half of, the, half of our country um, travels south in summer uh, for, for Italian vacation. Um, is that something you did as a child? And uh, when, when you think back to that time, how was it? Um, yes, it was always our number one destination uh, for, for trips when I was a kid. Um, we always drove down to Venice, um, Vignano. Uh, we also did a lot of our uh, junior camps over, over uh, winter in Lignano. Um, and yeah, always brings back memories uh, coming to Italy. Favorite pasta? Carbonara, maybe, yeah. Okay, we'll just go far left on to number three, please. Hi, Seth. Um, a lot of players talk about the intense pressure of like the first tee and, and all these really nerve wracking moments. Uh, when you experience those, is there going to be something that you say to yourself or go to mentally that will help put you at ease and, and navigate the moment? Yeah, I'm definitely, I definitely am going to have that. <laughs> um, but you just got to stick to your routine in that situation. I mean, I've never done it in such a big stage, so I guess it's easy to say now. But, uh, yeah, I think the, the main thing that helps is sticking to your routine and, and just trying to be as uh, – make it the situation as normal as possible. Okay, we'll take two on microphone one, if you could pass it over afterwards. Okay. All right. Uh, Seth, overall, thoughts on the course any holes that are particularly pleasing to your eye at all um yeah i think it's a really good course um it'll be great for match play there's a lot of very uh high risk reward shots um a couple of drivable par fours um reachable par fives and i think that'll be uh really fun to watch and really fun to play um you know i really like number number five i think it's a really cool reachable par four um the finishing stretch is really great. Uh, 16, 17, 18 is uh, three incredible holes. Those are, it's probably my favorite stretch on the course. Stay on that mic with that. Hi, Seth. As a rookie, I'm curious, have you asked advice from, say, Justin Rose or Rory? What kind of questions would you have asked them or have you talked to them about this whole experience and what you should expect? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you got to lean on those guys. I mean, it's incredible how many Ryder Cups they've been a part of and been successful in. So, um, yeah, uh, typical question like, what do you do on the first tee box when you can't feel your arms kind of thing? So, um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think the, the goal is you just got to play golf. Uh, but uh, yeah, just sharing stories and hearing stories from them uh, has been very helpful. What do you do when you can't feel your arms? Do they die? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, hope, I guess. But, uh, yeah, maybe just stick to the routine and, and hope you make a good swing. Okay, we'll go right across onto microphone four at the back. Hi, Seth. There's no mixed emotions for you, you said, but I'm wondering what the, the family dynamic is like with your parents at home and, and particularly your mum. What sort of week she's going to have? Uh, my mom, who's American, has been wearing an Austria hat uh, all, all, all last week while she was in Austria. So... Uh, yeah, I think uh, they're all Team Europe. You know, even my mom, who uh, grew up in the States, is 100% American. Um, spent 24 years in Austria. Um, you know, she's fallen in love with the country, and uh, I think she's 
she's probably just as Austrian as, uh, as a lot of Austrians are. Okay, we'll stay on mic four, please. Hello, um, yeah. Do you have any preferences of four bowls or four songs, and if so, why? Um, not really. They're very different. Um, they're kind of different mentalities. Uh, in the foursomes, you, it's hard to get in a rhythm sometimes um, just because you're only hitting every other shot, and then maybe you go eight, nine holes without having a real putt. Um, so that's always tough. And then the, the four ball, you just try to make as many bird, get as many birdie putts as you can, uh, try to make as many birdies as you can. So it's very different mentality, but I don't really have a, don't really have a preference. Okay, do we have any more questions or are we all done? Okay, so thanks for joining us. Thank we you. wish you well this week.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm very pleased to be joined by Ludwig Orberg from Team Europe. Ludwig, it's been a, an incredible few months for you, but now we're actually here in the Ryder Cup is real. Just tell us how your experience has been so far. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been cool, it's been a lot of fun. Um, kind of getting to know the guys a little bit more, spending some more time with them. Um, obviously today we got to play 18 holes and, and course looks a little bit different from when we were here the last time, but you know, it's really good, it's challenging, and it'll be good for match play. Thanks, we'll go with some questions. Dan on mic three, please. Here, hi Ludwig. Um, Luke said that he first started, Luke said he first started keeping tabs on you uh, in January, roughly, that you, you played in the Middle East, and I guess you played with Eduardo, or and uh, you know you got a good report. When did you start to believe that it was a legitimate possibility for you to make this team? Um, it wasn't when I was in school, <laughs> but uh, it was probably towards the late part of the summer when I started to play well. Um, got to play with Luke myself over the summer, so kind of got to, to start a relationship with him. And for me, um, you know, all I try to do is to play good golf. If someone would have told me a couple of months ago that. I would be here playing a Ryder Cup, probably wouldn't believe them, but um, you know, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's a dream come true for me to be here and looking forward to a nice couple of days. And then just how important was the PGA Tour U program in this journey that you've had over the last couple of months? Oh, I mean, I don't think without the PGA Tour U I would be here. So for me, I owe a lot to the PGA Tour U program uh, and what they've done. And you know, they're continuing to do it, continuing to develop the program. and. I know it's going to make college golf better, it's going to make amateur golf better, and eventually it's going to make pro golf better too. So I feel like, you know, it's, it's really cool, and I'm very lucky to kind of be the first guy to take advantage of this. Okay, we're going to cross to your right-hand side on mic four, please, Andy. Hi, Ludwig. Um, we all love your country, Sweden, um, but there aren't too many famous Swedes. I mean, Abba, Henrik Stenson, Ibrahimovic, Bjorn Borg. Yeah. I just wonder, how does it feel for you to be as famous as them in such a short time? And could you go on to actually eclipse uh, those guys and become Sweden's most famous person? I would not put myself in the same sentence as Abba. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all I try to do is play golf. Um, I try to hit as few shots as I can every tournament that I play in. And, you know, um, yeah, I guess so. And, and then we, we spoke about this briefly at Wentworth and you were quite modest about your nickname, The Stud. <laughs> you were quite keen to get to the bottom of it of why you were called that. I wonder if you, if you have, and are you used to it yet? And you know, this kind of, kind of excuse me, sexy golf image that you've, you've got. I mean, it's very flattering for sure. Um, to be fair, I haven't thought about it too much since we spoke the last time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, be, uh, I'll be very proud if someone calls me that, so uh, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Just go behind to Owen on mic two, please. Uh, hi, hi, Ludwig. People who speak highly of you have mentioned your um, patience as a, as a player. So two questions, if I can. One, do, do you know why that, where, where that comes from? I know your parents, your upbringing or whatever. And two, uh, connected, what is it, if anything, that makes you really cross? That makes me what? Really angry. Oh, when do you lose your face? <laughs> um, well, I do think one of the things that I do quite well is that I have a, whenever I'm playing golf, I have a pretty high level of acceptance. Um, so whenever I'm on the golf course, obviously, um, you know, when I'm practicing, I try to be as good as, an, good as I can. But when you're on the golf course, you know, it is what it is, whatever happened before, and all you can do is try to react to it. Um, so that's the way I try to view every, all, every golf round. And, you know, luckily it's, it's uh, you know, been quite successful for me. Um, and the one thing that makes me angry, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Uh, I'm a pretty calm guy. I don't get too high. Um, so, uh, I'll, you know, hopefully I won't get too angry this week either. Okay, we'll go to Mike Four on the front row, please. Hello, Ludwig Lawrence Porten. Can you describe how big it is for you to be here considering turning pro only in June and not as yet uh, entered a major tournament. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think kind of like I touched on before where if someone would have told me a couple of months ago that I would be here playing a Ryder Cup, probably wouldn't believe him. Um, but I would believe him, you know, if I said that I could do it, probably, yeah. But, um, you know, it's really cool the way that these last couple of months has, uh, has you know, paid out for me. Um, 
it's been uh, quite intense, and uh, you know, I'm trying to embrace it. I try to enjoy it, mm. but it's really cool to be here. Yeah. Everyone says that you never get nervous. What will it be like on the first tee? I wish I never got nervous. <laughs> um, I think, you know, obviously, anyone that plays golf, um, you know, feels a nerve sometimes. Uh, so do I, obviously. Um, and I'm going to feel those same things on on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. Um, but you know, it's it's uh, it's very much an excitement. It's very much an uh, anticipation of what's to come. And I try to view it as something good. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to, you know, affect my behavior in a in a poor way. Uh, it's more of a something that you know it, it shows that I care. So uh, I'm looking forward to having those feelings again. Hey Ludwig, we're going to cross the left and Mike one. Hey Ludwig, yeah, just another question about the college, um, the system there. And how it's prepared you for the stage, what does it say for the strength of the college system that, you know, you're playing already on this stage and, um, you know, what, what, did, what did Texas do for you and, and Coach Greg Sands there? Um, yeah, you know, I, if I owe a lot to the PGA Tour U program, I owe uh, a lot more to Texas Tech University. Um, I feel like they gave me the opportunities to come over to the States, play practice. Um, we play a really good schedule. We play, you know, good um, – preparing golf courses so I do feel like whenever you get to the PGA Tour or wherever you play um, you've already experienced those golf courses which is a, a pretty good thing for me especially it kind of teaches you you know what shots you might need um, kind of what to what to expect whenever you get there so I felt like I had a pretty good idea of uh, what to expect whenever I did turn pro um, and then you know I feel like the, the level of, of competition in college is really good too so I feel like there's a lot of guys that, you know, play very well. Um, obviously, there's a few things to improve on as a player, as there always is. But I do feel like, in general, the level's really well, um, very preparing. So I would recommend anyone who's considering going to college to do so. Okay, you have, stay on my you, have, you have a double pressure. First of all, the Ryder Cup. Second, everybody is t talking about you. You are will be the future, the future star, whatever, compliments and what. How do you deal with this situation? I mean, you, you much as pressure is more fuel to, to show up how good you are. And second, for you, what the main quality for a golf player, which must be? My main quality no, 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 as a no, player? In general, for a, for a, a great uh, uh, golf player, which quality he has to be, to have? What was the first question? <laughs> uh, the pressure, yes. Um, you know, I, I do feel like uh, it's, first off, it's very flattering. Um, you know, it's been really nice to hear those things that other players say. And, you know, I can't really do anything about it. Obviously, it's very nice. Um, but, um, you know, it's a part of the game. I feel like, um, you know, all I try to do is, like I said before, is to prepare for every tournament the best I can. and. Um, you know, do good practice, and then whenever a tournament starts, uh, show up ready and, and have fun playing. Um, that's all I try to do, and it doesn't really change this week. It's just a different environment. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of these things that I'm doing these days are the first time I'm doing them. So um, I'm, I'm trying to embrace it. I try to have fun with it. And, um, you know, especially this week, too, is, is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I think in terms of the a good thing that every player has is, you know, they control their emotions very well. Um, you know, whether you get angry, you let it out really quickly, or whether you get sad, you get you, you let it go very quickly too. And it's, it's all about staying in the moment. Um, I feel like if you get too stuck in the past, it's gonna affect you. If you get too, too stuck in the future, it's also gonna affect you. So I do feel like a lot of the good players, they, they have a tendency to stay in the moment quite well. Okay, we've got Mike three. Hi Ludwig, um, everybody talks about you just being an incredible driver of the ball. Um, so I'm just wondering how did you, over the years, like develop that skill? Like what kind of stuff did you do in practice and, and in order to get your skill at that point? Uh, I tried to hit it as hard as I could um, and then tried to narrow it down a little bit after that. But, you know, obviously um, the driver is the most fun club to hit. It goes to furthest and uh, I felt that way since I was probably 10 and I still feel that way. So. Um, you know, I, I like hitting my driver, and then luckily it's, it's one of my better clubs in the bag, too. And then in terms of, like, you know, you, you hit it hard and then you try to narrow it down, is that, that's, does that mean golf swing stuff that you start, that you 
did in order to do that, or were you trying to just focus on the target most of the time? Um, you know, I, I, I like to keep it a pretty neutral flight. I don't like to curve it too much, so um, sometimes you get too stuck on one side where you draw it too much or you fade it too much, but I feel like when I grow up, um, you know, I try to hit it as straight as I could and then take it from there, but um, hitting the center of the face was a big thing for me. I try to hit it hard, but keep it in the center of the face, um, and, then, uh, and then, yeah, take it from there. Okay, we're going to cross to this side to Mike too, Ali. Hi, Ludwig. Uh, in terms of previous Ryder Cups that you've watched, who's particularly inspired you? Whose footsteps would you like to follow in, in the European team? Um, you know, I feel like the one that sticks out in my memory is the 2012. Um, I've gotten to know Peter Hansen quite well and Nicholas over there, so they've been telling me stories a lot about that day at Medina and, um, you know, just to understand how much it means to them and how much it means to the whole European side has been pretty cool. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to do something similar this week um, and hopefully we'll be able to inspire other kids growing up and other people coming after us, but, um, you know, it's, it's a really cool environment to be in and, um, you know, like we said before, we're trying to write our own chapter. Mm. I mean, Ian Poulter had a very good Ryder Cup in 2012 and has played a massive part. And, mm -hmm. You know, the, the way that he sort of embraced the Ryder Cup, could, could you see yourself, not necessarily in your first Ryder Cup, but trying to take on that sort of role? Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all, all, we're, all we're trying to do is win points. Um, and w however, what that looks like, we don't really know, especially for me. I don't really know what that's going to look like. Um, I'll, but... You know, I will say that I'll try to play my game and, um, and trust that it's good enough and then, you know, see where that takes me. Okay, back a couple of rows to Mike Four. Uh, uh, Ludwig, great, great that you're here. Um, you said earlier how calm you are. Is there anything you do? Like, you, do you meditate? Does it come from your parents? What is the secret behind that? Because most of them are golf course. <laughs> I, I've tried meditating, um, but I get too bored to do it, to be fair, so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, I don't do necessarily anything special. Um, I just try to be myself and, uh, and not try to be anyone else. And a second question. Um, the course setup, do you think it favors the Europeans or the Americans? A lot of talk about the rough, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, I do feel like um, in general as a team, we're a good drew of the drivers. Um, the, the fairways are going to be important to be on. Uh, it's going to be a lot easier to win points if you're in the fairway. So I feel like in general as a group, we do that quite well. Um, and then, you know, take it from there. But I do feel like uh, it's in favor of us, yeah. Okay, we're going to take the final question on the far left with Neil. Hi. Uh, how have you found the team room experience? Um, who are the big characters in there? And have you felt able to be yourself? Yeah. Um, you know, it's been really cool for me to be in those team environments. Um, I, I do feel like... It's, uh, it's a bit different from, <laughs> from a college team environment. Uh, the level of golf is a bit better, um, but it's still very, very similar. The, the foundations are very similar. So, um, you know, I, I try, to, try to have fun. Um, you know, obviously everyone's been very respectful to me and, and been treating me in a really good way, so I feel very welcome. Um, but uh, it's a bit different for me, and, and all I try to do is be myself and, uh, and see where that takes me. Okay, Ludwig, thanks for joining us. We wish you all this week. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm joined by Shane Lowry of Team Europe. Shane, I think we all know how passionate you are about the Ryder Cup. How's the experience been today and how much are you looking forward to playing in front of the home fans? Yeah, um, it, it was good, good out there today. It was nice to get out and get 18 holes done. Um, you know, we can focus on different things over the next couple of days now, playing nine each day. Uh, um, obviously, uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I feel very excited for the team we have, and I'm looking forward to a great week. Um, so, yeah.
Thanks, Shane. We'll go to some questions. Start on mic three at the back, Nick. Hey. Good afternoon, Shane. Yeah. Uh, two weeks ago, you were asked about the negative reaction in some quarters about you being picked for this European yeah. team. And you said it didn't sit very well with you and you felt like you deserved your, your place on the team. Uh, I'm wondering, are you still annoyed? And if so, what are you particularly annoyed about? Did you think it was disrespectful from some people in golf considering your career? No, uh, uh, I think if even with my year that I've had, statistically, it's better than some of the people that you were talking about that should have been picked ahead of me. So um, that's statistics don't lie. So that's the reason I'm here. Um, and obviously, I showed a couple of weeks after that that I played some pretty good golf and to be honest I feel like at the Irish Open and Wentworth I've played probably some of the best golf I've played all year so I'm pretty happy where my game is at coming into this week and um, I always feel coming in here that I can add a lot to the team um, not only on the golf course but in the team room and around all of that so yeah um, yeah, I'm, yeah that's that's just how I felt that's how I feel look you, you have to back yourself um, if people are t talking about you, saying you shouldn't be on the team or this, that and the other, you, it's obviously not going to sit well with you because you feel like you should be there and you really want to be there. So, yeah. I felt like at the Irish Open, what should have been an amazing few days after getting picked on the Ryder Cup team was kind of a bit of a downer for me um, because it's, I had to kind of fight all this off all this negative talk in my head. Um, but I did a good job of that. Ah, yeah. Look, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can really look. That's... It's a small thing like that you just block out and you go and play your game. But, um, yeah, I think, look, I think I said it at the Irish Open. I think, I think we have the 12, 12 best players in Europe here this week. Um, I'm very confident in our team. OK, we're going to go to Philip, please, on the right. Hi, Shane. Yep. Uh, we in Ireland are well aware of the family's legacy in sport with your mm. dad and your uncles playing a different sport, of course. But it was a team sport, and could you just talk a little bit about how much team sports mean to you? And just kicking on a little bit from that last question, how much of a role as a leader you can actually play this time around? Yeah, um, look, obviously team sports played a big part in my whole life growing up, and I think it's where I get my competitiveness from is my dad and, and his brothers and my uncles. Um, it's, you know, uh, growing up in that environment was pretty cool, and I think it's a lot of it is what's has got me to where I am today. Um, look, I feel like I feel like I'm just myself. I don't, I don't try to be anyone else in the team room. I don't try to be anyone else when I'm here. I just be myself, and that just happens to be, you know, what I am. I'm, I'm in there. Um, uh, not that I'm not there. I'm generally the last person to leave the team room in the evenings. That's not for any other reason other than I just like hanging out and talking. And drinking Diet Cokes, that are probably not outside that Pepsi, maybe. Are we outside that? Yeah, I'm going to get in trouble for that. But um, yeah, look, I, I just like <clears throat> the environment of being around a lot of people. I always have to have, I think if you see me, you guys come to a lot of tournaments, you see me at tournaments, I always have to have people around me. I hate being on my own, uh, so I feel like I thrive in this environment. Okay, we'll go to you, Brian. Yeah, just following on from that, Shane speaking to you, you're whistling straights a couple of years ago, fresh off that defeat, you said, look, I didn't cry when I won the Open, I didn't cry when my daughter was born Yeah. I cried, I cried today, is that how much it means to you? Yeah, look, it's an emotional week and even um, you know, some of the stuff that's happened already this week it would get you quite emotional, I think um, being a part of something that is bigger than you or anything else uh, is pretty cool and I think um, Whistling Straits was hard to take um, but it was quite motivating for me coming away from that and it's quite motivating for me this week so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going out there and hopefully, you know, earning some points for Europe and hopefully we can all do a great job at trying to win the trophy back You didn't go out until the afternoon last time, uh, are you sort of straining at the leash to get out there early this time? Have you put your hand Yeah, look, I'll, I'll do whatever I'm told um, I'm honestly I'm here I don't care if if I don't play at all and we win 
I don't really care. I'm just here to win. Um, and I think we're, we're all here for the same cause. Okay, we could cross the mic for Andy. Hi, Shane. Hi. Um, may I ask, you said some things that have happened this week already to make you emotional. May I ask for any details on that, please? Um, as I was saying that, I was like, probably shouldn't be saying this, but it's... Um, Too late. No, uh, look, a lot of stuff goes into this week and, you know, there's certain videos that are played in the team rooms in the evenings and motivational videos and um, just kind of hits, hits home a little bit. So, um, you know, I'm not going to elaborate much further than that, but uh, Luke and his team have done a great job already this week and running on Tuesday. So, um, yeah, I'm excited for what's to come for the rest of the week. Well, I was going to follow on from that, but I remember at Glen Eagles specifically, Paul McGinley had blue and gold fish and I think Alex Ferguson popped in to see the, the players and give them a motivational speech. Has, has anything like that happened? So yeah, look, they, they, they don't, we don't have a uh, fish tank in our, <laughs> in our team room this time, but it's everything, there's no stone uh, is left unturned this week by the tour. Uh, everyone at the, Euro, the DP World Tour do an amazing job this week and to make this week the most special week in golf, um, not only in the golf course, but, you know, looking after us, our families, everything about it is, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure there's a few more surprises to come, um, and that's what makes it very special as well. And have you cried already? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll go to Dennis on mic too, please. Shane, when you left Whistling Straits the last time, you said you were really looking forward to getting back and uh, getting another chance at one of these. Uh, how different is it coming in as a second time or as a stig from being a debutante? And secondly, obviously, last time in Whistling Straits, there were no European yeah. fans because of the, the COVID restrictions. I'm sure you're really looking forward to playing in front of a, a home crowd. Yeah. Um, obviously, it feels a lot different because I've been here before, um, been in the environment and all that. But also, this is my first home Ryder Cup. So, I mean, there was obviously a few people out there today. It wasn't as big as obviously it's going to be on maybe Thursday and Friday. Uh, and... Yeah, it's going to be a lot different. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Um, but it's also going to be, there's going to be a little few challenges that I might have to fight with myself uh, over. You know, kind of you have to control your emotions out there. Um, you don't want to get, let the, your emotions get the better of you. Uh, I think in Western Straits, letting out emotion kind of had to get you, you needed that to get you going because there was no fans to cheer you on. It was, uh, you know... So we'll see how, how this week goes, but that's kind of in my head what I'm thinking about this week so far. Okay, we'll cross to Dan on mic one. Dan? Didn't you just cry a lot now? No. But you said you didn't with the first born daughter, now it's before the tournament even starts? <laughs> um, emotional stuff, Dan. Um, Rory, I don't remember where it was, but Rory McIlroy said he'd love to go to battle with you this week. He'd love to play with you this week. Uh, hearing a, you know, a legend of the game say that, well, what kind of emotion does that elicit in you? And don't cry. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's uh, obviously Rory and I are good friends. So I think um, we would love to play together and we'd love to go out there at some stage. We probably feel like we didn't do ourselves justice in four balls uh, at Whistling Straits. And I think we maybe would like the opportunity to kind of, um, I suppose... Uh, yeah, maybe we'd like the opportunity to go at it again and try and win a point this time, I think. Um, but I, I honestly don't know. Um, and you might call whatever on that, but I honestly don't know what, what's going to happen on Friday or Saturday yet. We haven't been told. Obviously, we played today and we're going to play the next couple of days and I'm sure we'll find out soon. But, um, yeah, it would be nice. Obviously, look, anybody would want to play with Rory. He's one of the best players in the world. Um, he's one of the best players, in my opinion, He's in the top players of all time already, and he's not even nearly finished. So, yeah, it'd be nice to go out there with him. Let's go along the road to Steve on mic three. Just a question about Luke. Um, obviously, in some respects, he's like an accidental captain after what happened to Henrik, but um, how has he settled into the role? Is he a natural captain? What's his style, in your opinion? How, how is he in the, in the team room? Um, Luke has been amazing. Um, yeah, I've obviously gotten to know Luke a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, I think... Um, you know, Luke doesn't say much, but when he says it, you listen. Uh, and he's always been that way. And I think that he's that type of captain. I think he's very much a. He will do everything in his power. He will do everything. He will call the right shots. He'll make the hard decisions. It's it's because it's a it's a tough one for a captain coming into this environment. Maybe 
being friendly with players and playing golf with them over the years and then having to you know maybe leave them out drop them uh, make tough decisions and I think Luke won't be afraid to do that and I think that's what's going to make him a great captain Thank you. Go forward to Michael one please and just to follow up on the Royce up there he seemed to be having a bit of fun today on the, the eight was that Roy's ball you threw into the water or can you tell us what, what happened there yeah, well, it looked like me and uh, Tommy were going to win the hole, and then he chipped in from nowhere. So that was <laughs> disappointing. No, we were just having a bit of fun out there. We were playing a game, and and uh, he won the hole, so I threw his ball away. <laughs> that was it. Okay, we'll go final question on mic three, please. Hi, um, how was the uh, Stade de France on Saturday? Amazing, yeah. Do you take it, like? Do you watch that through an athlete's point of view, or do you watch that purely as a fan? And you see how a team's developing there. Do you take anything from that into the week this, a week like this? Um, purely as a fan. Um, I'd know a few of the players personally on the Irish team, so it was nice to see them out there competing at that level. Uh, I think we're very excited about our rugby team and our chances over the next few weeks. Um, and I'm, on that band, band, I'm all over that bandwagon. So uh, um, hopefully... Hopefully, I'll go back in a few weeks for maybe quarterfinals or semifinals and hopefully more. But uh, I probably wouldn't. It's, it's different. Um, I think it's nice to see them doing well and it's nice to see them being successful. But I think when it comes to this week, you don't really use much. It's just you're there purely as a fan. Okay. Shane, thanks for joining us. Have a good week. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm pleased to be joined by John Ram from Team Europe. John, you guys are all coming in and saying how much they've been enjoying the experience so far. What's it been like for you being back in that team room and out on the golf course? It's, it's incredible. Um, you know, when you've done it a couple of times, you almost know what to expect. And in a way, the sense of anticipation for the Ryder Cup, it's, it's emphasized a little bit more just because, you know, I know and we do know what was to come this week and how much fun it's going to be. So uh, it's been definitely special the last few weeks, you know, being at home and, and letting yourself think about it a little bit. Um, it's been fun. Uh, you know, the greatest thing of the Ryder Cup, apart from winning, obviously, is uh, going in that team room and, and seeing all these great golfers come together and, and, you know, really be a team and be friends and, and have a really special, unique bond throughout the week uh, that it truly changes the, the relationship towards the future as well, right? And from before and after Ryder Cup, um, those memories you create uh, were going to last a lifetime and, you know, friendships and uh, the bonds get even stronger. So it's, uh, it's, a little bit, it's a lot of fun to be a part of it. Thanks, Tom. Guys, any questions? Alex on mic three. John, I'm just going to follow up on that. Everybody comes in here and tells you how great the experience is. Of course, we only can know how great that is from you. But back in the early days when they started the Ryder Cup, that's what it was. It was all experiences and learning to enjoy each other and stuff like that. But after, you know, sometime in the late 90s, that changed. And there's money involved where players get money towards their foundations or charities and stuff like that. My question is, is would you play for free? I didn't even know we got any money, so... I'm sorry, I really had no idea. So yeah, me, yeah, I, w I would, I wouldn't, I don't have to get paid to come here and, and perform in front of people, to be honest. And then the second question, because it is so much fun, would you pay to play? <laughs> <laughs> pay for what and how much? Well, <laughs> I think it's negotiable. I mean, if there was an entry fee to be a part of the team, yeah. <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah, this this week is a lot of fun. But yeah, I think uh, as long as it's manageable for everybody on the team, uh, right? Because we have one that, you know, was in college like two days ago. So, you know, as long as everybody on the team can, you know, it's it's okay for everybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It means a lot to us, and I think it'll be something that 
uh, I'll be willing to do. Okay, we'll go across to John on two. John, the, the world rankings tell us that you're one of the three best players on the European team. Does that bring with it an extra responsibility in your mind? No. I mean, I was world number one going to the last Ryder Cup, and it really didn't mean anything. I, I like to think that whatever we have done before this week and whatever we may do after this week doesn't really matter or shouldn't really impact how we prepare for this week, right? At the end of the day, it's match play, and it's all about doing the best job you can to beat the person in front of you that, that session. That's, that's really it. So whatever you've won before or not doesn't really... It's a different atmosphere, it's a different environment, so that shouldn't really matter. Across to Mike Juan on the other side. Hi, John. Uh, you're well known for being a bit of a history buff when it comes to the Ryder Cup. Um, what would you say were the two free moments historically that you would you know, take out as, as especially motivating or especially um, important for you personally? Well, for us, you have to say 87, because the first time you were born uh, on American soil. Uh, I don't really go based on always on magnitude, right? Uh, but obviously the 06 Ryder Cup was quite special, and with the whole influence of Darren Clark that week uh, made it quite, quite a bit more special. And then if I had to pick one more was when Sergio won his singles matches on... on on Sunday against Ricky to become the all-time leader on the points list in, uh, for Europe. I mean, that's just really off the top of my head. I probably could come up with a lot more examples that are just as important. Uh, but that I could think of right now would be those three. Okay, we'll take two on there on three with Riath and then Jeremy. John, um, Paul McGinley was speaking recently about the kind of leading players in this team, and particularly yourself and Rory and your win rates. He was sort of saying Rory's got a 50% win rate, you've got 56, and he was, he was comparing that to guys like Monty, Poulter, Lou Donald himself, up in the 60s and 70s, and he said, you guys kind of really need to step up on the basis of, um, you know, bridging the 10 points out and whistling straights. I know you obviously got three and a half points there, but how do you feel about your Ryder Cup record? Do you sort of share that sentiment that there needs to be a sort of step up? I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, I mean, do I, th I don't think I need to do anything different to what I've done in the past. But yeah, I think it's, it's my role to go out there and try to win as much as I can, yeah. I, I really don't know how to, that's sort of implying that I haven't stepped up, so I really don't know uh, how to answer that. Um, but yeah, in a sense, yeah, I mean, it's usually the, the leaders of a team who have to go out there and, and, and show a little bit more, um, I mean, exactly that leadership and getting those points. But yeah, I, yeah, I really don't know how to answer that question. Sorry. No, I, I don't think it was implied as a criticism as such. But as, as, as an individual, John, do you, as, as one of the leading players in the team, do you have an idea in your head at the start of a week as, as a sort of points tally? Is there... Oh, well, well hopefully I can go 5-0, and oh, yeah. Or 4-0, or 3-0, oh, or, oh, or however many times I play, yeah. I mean... Uh, my intention is to go out there and win every single match, and, but, and that's my... But is there, is, is there a sort of a standard in your own mind that represents a good week, or is it if the team wins, it's a good week, or does it personally need only three from five? Or I can go 0-5 and, and team wins, I'll be really happy. As long as we win, I don't care. As long as we get to 14 and a half points, what I do doesn't really matter. Okay, Jeremy. Hi, John. Um, Shane was in here earlier talking about fact that you've watched some motivational stuff on video mm -hmm. um, the last couple of days. I wonder if you could tell us what, what sort of stuff you've been watching and how it, how it made you feel. I mean, it's, 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 I don't know how much of that they're going to post, so that's kind of personal for us. Uh, we got, I think, very few people on those rooms, because we have some individual videos and some collective videos. There's very few players not shedding a few tears and, uh, yesterday afternoon, I can say that. Um, was it former win, winning teams, was it family stuff? It, it, it was a lot of family related and the reason why all of us are here, yeah. Uh, I don't want to say too much more than that, but I think even for people that are related, it's going to definitely, you know, if you guys were to watch it, it'll make you feel a lot of the same emotions we felt. Okay, we'll go to Dan and Mike Juan. 
you joked about Ludwig being in college a few months ago, but that was you once. You know, you, you didn't play in the Ryder Cup right away, but you had this fast start to mm -hmm. your professional career. What was the toughest part of navigating those first few months? It's, it's weird because I don't know how much of a time off he had, but because I had certain starts and, and I played the U.S. Open, there wasn't like any downtime, right? I think we went from nationals to going back home and get ready because you play in a U.S. Open. So it was w in a weird way, it just seemed like almost the same. Uh, and because I played a major before I went to my first PGA Tour event, it almost like felt like a, not a downsize, but easier in that sense. Uh, and I performed well enough in, in both. Um, it's weird to say what to get used to. I think early on, is is the travel and how much you do right in college golf you what is it travel saturday sunday's practice round you play monday and tuesday tuesday night you're at home uh you know some of those pga tour events you get there sunday night on monday and you're playing two practice rounds for one and the pro am and four days of tournament so it's um it's sort of why the same reason as to why kobe blamed those air balls against you entirely in his career right he's just not being conditioned for that many games in a row you almost have to get used to playing as that much golf, right? Uh, and that might not come into play for him a little bit later, but that was definitely something that uh, I had to learn out early on. How's he gelling with the team? He's good. I mean, he's quiet. Like, I think everybody is in the first Ryder Cup. I didn't say much either, right? And in his case, he hasn't even been a pro for that long, so a lot of us haven't had the chance to, to create that relationship with him. But uh, it's pretty incredible is what he's done right off the gates. Um, you know, having a great Sunday in Crowns and, and a really strong performance in Wentworth, so clearly has the potential. Okay, we'll get the right-hand side, Ali. Hi, John. The uh, American players who've been in this room today have been asked about the fact that the American team hasn't won a Ryder Cup in Europe since 1993, and whether that's a big motivating factor for them, which I imagine it is. How much of a motivating factor is it for you and the European team to keep the home run going, to make it seven in a row at home, John? It's a big deal. You want to want to um, you want to stretch the streak as much as possible, right? And you know, hopefully, we can get into the 30s of years of of Europe being undefeated here at home. Okay, we'll go to the left hand side, Rick. Hi, John. Um, you've spoken about Sergio's influence a lot. Um, I just wonder whether you called him. Has he called you in the run up to this, just for advice or? bit of a motivation? I did. I did talk to him and ask for advice. Um, you know, he, he did show me a lot of what to do at Whistling and, and obviously in Paris as well. But uh, I did have a little bit of a chat with him and, and with Poulter as well. Um, you know, not that there is going to be easy to take on the role that those two guys had both on and off the golf course. But, uh, you know, just to hear them talk about what they thought and what they felt is, is obviously invaluable information. Can you say when that was? Was that last week or after when? Oh, Poulter was a little bit uh, longer than last week. Sergio, I mean, as recently as yesterday. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take the final question from Anne, please. What kind of advice and wisdom can you share with the rookies? <laughs> well, that depends on the questions that they, or what they, they're asking me about, right? It really depends. Uh, I always tell them, you know, it's very easy to really be in your in your mind and your feelings because you don't really know how to process a week like this. So ask as many questions as you can from anybody, right? It's There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just that curiosity is going to get you somewhere. And uh, at the same time, I understand that they're here wanting to prove, you know, why they're here and, and make their mark as rookies. But... There's always something to learn from some of the great players. I don't mean necessarily mean golf-wise. It's just how they process and how they deal with a week like this, right? So I think that curiosity is, is very, very important. Are they asking you some of the questions that perhaps you asked Sergio? Uh, no, not me. But like I said, my first Ryder Cup, I didn't ask one single question. I was about as quiet as one can be. Um, I'm very shy and introverted by nature. So it, everything, you know, the whole week seemed a little daunting at first, right? And you go into a locker room where people have been sharing for 15 to 20 years. So it's very hard to, you know, get in. At least it was very hard for me to fit in right away like that. A lot easier the second time, though. Okay, John, thanks for your time. We wish you all the best. This Thank week. you.
Makes you look super short here. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm joined by Victor Hovland from Team Europe. Victor, just give us a sense of your experience so far and um, being here this week. Uh, it's been a terrific individual season for you. How much are you looking forward to then translating that into the team environment? Yeah, it's been a it's been a great year for me. Um, played a lot of good golf, but uh, this is the Ryder Cup and. Uh, that all kind of goes out the window. You're here to perform for the team. And um, obviously after what happened two years ago, uh, I think we're, we're all pretty motivated to, to get the cup back to, to Europe. And um, I think we're, we're all just having a blast and we're going to try to get the best out of our games possible this week. Thanks, Victor. We'll go to question on mic three. Hi, Victor. Speaking about... Uh Western Straits two years ago. What were your personal learnings and takeaways from that? You know, can you elaborate a little bit? And, you know, how you've reflected on the event, which went for personally for you, it went very well in many ways. Well, um, I felt like I played okay that week. Um, I, I hit the ball well enough to to get a few points. Um, we certainly met a very strong U.S. team, and and it was it was hard to get those points. Uh, I felt like I played okay, but I lack the the special things in the matches to where you really flip the momentum around and you can um, you know build on a on a big putt or an up and down or maybe a chip in or something like that and and uh, that just wasn't there. I I hit a lot of great iron shots into tough pin positions and it was blowing. It it played hard, but um, I just I just didn't finish it off. And uh, I think this time around with all the work that I've done in the short game um, and s some of the accomplishments that I've, that I've made in the, in the last few tournaments and throughout the year, I feel like I'm a lot more accomplished. And even if I don't have my game or I don't hit it as well as I would have liked, I, don't, I still feel like I can, I can win or get up and down from a terrible spot. I can, you know, it's not like, oh, I have to be in a perfect spot to, to have a chance to, to win the match. I can... You know, I, is, there's a belief and a confidence that I can get myself out of any situation, and I think that's uh, that's a huge turnaround from from last time. Okay, go to John, Mike, too. Uh, Victor, I just asked John Ram the, the same question, but um, the world rankings tell us that you and John and Rory are the three best players on the team. Does that bring with it any kind of extra responsibility in your mind? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, th I think that's cool. Um, you can. <laughs> I mean, you can use the ranking to to look at you know oh the last six months or the last five months and all that stuff, but it, it just goes out the window this week. Um, you know the whatever technically the twelfth ranked player on their team could be the best player on their team right now, and so just because someone's ranked a little bit higher on the world rankings doesn't mean that they're going to be tougher to beat this week. And um, you know it, it's cool to have on the team you know it gives you maybe a little bit extra com uh, confidence or you feel a little bit better about the week but we still got to go out there and and play like the best players in the world and and we got to get some points for our team go on mike three on this left hand side um talking to you guys like paul mcginley um you know they speak a lot about the rivalry that used to be more clear in a way that Europeans played in Europe, Americans played in America. Nowadays, you guys pretty much all play together. I mean, you've grown up with, with Colin Murakawa. Um, uh, you know, how does it affect the rivalry of the Ryder Cup, in, in, your, in your opinion? I, I can't speak for the, the guys that played in the pa past, but it seems that we probably hate each other less than, than guys used to in the past. Um, but... Sure, uh, hate is a big motivator to do well. That's just a fact. But I think where we are now, we're more motivated maybe to, to win for our country and continent. We want to win for Europe. It's not so much to – obviously, we want to beat the Americans. That's We, we enjoy that. Uh, but it's not because we hate the other team. It's because we, we love Europe and we want to do well for, for the people that support us. 
stay on mic three, just in the row behind. Uh, hi, Victor. Uh, you making some funny films about your short game. <laughs> it's really, really fun. Uh, tell me about, because your short game is better and better and better, how you working on your short game? Maybe you have some new coach from the short game and tell me some stuff about this. Yeah, well, I, uh, I got together with Joe Mayo at the start of the year, and um, um, it's no secret that I've never been great around the greens, um, and to play at the highest level, it's very difficult to, to beat the best players in the world if you, if you can't get the ball up and down, because especially when the courses get tough, you're, you're going to miss greens, and you're going to be in spots where you're going to have to figure it out. And um, he basically just explained the physics of why I – didn't have a great short game before. It wasn't because I wasn't talented enough or I didn't have the quote-unquote hands to do it. Um, I, you know, I was essentially just getting a little too shallow into the ball and getting way behind it. And it's great if you want to hit long drives uh, or, you know, fast balls around the green. You want to slow the ball down. So you want to essentially do the opposite of what you do to hit a, a drive and when he explained that, you know, certain feels that I have in my short game and just explain how to do that, it just kind of clicked to me. And, and I was able to do it right away on the practice screen. Obviously, it takes a while for it to, to feel comfortable and do it in tournaments. But as soon as I got the feel and it clicked to me, uh, it was just a matter of putting the work in and, um, yeah, just um, getting more comfortable. Back on that mic. Well, another one. Um, <laughs> we we got a one-on-one -on -one interview yeah, yeah. going right here. I love it. Um, watching the Solheim Cup, I was thinking that you know there's such a lot of um, Northern European players in women golf and in men's golf. How does it come about? Is that a coincidence, or or if you go back you know, to your childhood, you know, where does it all come from? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it's something that I haven't really thought about. Um, you know, seeing the, the European team had five Swedes on that team. Um, and that's 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 pretty cool to you know see. Even though I'm Norwegian, it's it's pretty cool to see that um, a lot of um, Scandinavians are are doing so well. Um, you know what I I really don't know. They they must have a obviously they have a great culture for for golf there. I mean the Swedes they have a lot of players um, on the men's tour. Um, and I just think they have a, a great culture there. Um, maybe. I, I think there's a lot more players that play men's professional golf. And I, I think that just makes it a little bit difficult, for example, for five men or male Swedish players to, for example, be on this team. I think it's just a sheer numbers problem. Uh, but obviously that proves that they have a great culture that they're uh, doing uh, in Sweden, for example. Okay, we're going to front row on mic one. Does foursomes, because it's so unique as a format, sort of require one of the players to take a leadership role of the, the team on the course? And, and if so, what does that a good fulfillment of that role look like? I, I don't know if it's a leadership role, but I think it's... I, I think it's... You're just trying to figure out what's the best strategy to win your matches and some people might be a, a little less talkative or maybe a little bit more um, laid back or don't talk as much so the other guy maybe fills that role but we're we're both teammates and we're trying to create a rapport where one guy can trust the other and vice versa uh, so I think it's more just about creating trust I don't think it's one guy has to say, oh, okay, I'll take the ownership of everything. It's more just, okay, what do I have to do to, to, to fill this partnership? And, and um, I think we just try to lean on each other in that way. Okay, do we have any more questions for Victor? Or are we all done? Okay, Victor, thanks for joining us. Love it. We wish you well this week. Yep, thanks. Thanks.